So, Paul in Romans 10 verse 17 has just finished saying, and we looked at this two weeks ago, that the rightness, the righteousness that all of us long for, that all of us crave, is not a wage that we earn, it's a gift that we receive. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, talking about righteousness, and that's somewhat of a big theological, biblical word, and it's not part of our everyday use. But when we began to dissect what righteousness really is and what it looks like, we concluded that all of us long for it. All of us crave it. We, we long to be right. We don't want to be on the wrong side of things. We want ourselves to be right. We want our children to be right. We want our lives to be right. And we spend so much time and energy trying to secure rightness, righteousness for ourselves. And Paul says in Romans chapter 10 that the righteousness that we long for, the righteousness that we desperately seek, the righteousness that we crave is not a wage that we earn. It's not something we can go out and get on our own, but rather it's a gift that we receive. It's a gift of grace that we receive by the gift of faith, he says in verse 17, which only comes from the preaching of the gospel. And so what he says in verse 17 is that God awakens faith, opens the eyes of faith so that we can see that the rightness that we long for is something that we receive from God. It's not something we have to earn. God awakens faith. He opens the eyes of faith through the preaching of Jesus. He makes that very clear in verse 17. He says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ or the word about Christ. So when we hear that there was one who came outside of us to secure a righteousness for us, God uses that by his spirit to open our eyes and now we see that Jesus has come to do for us what we could never do for ourselves and the burden rolls off of our back and we're set free. God awakens faith through the preaching of grace. But now he says in these verses that there were those back in the day who heard the word about Christ and did not believe. They, they, I mean, the, it was preached to them, and they did not believe. So look at what he says in verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In other words, there were people back in the day who heard who heard the gospel, who heard about what God has done, what God will do, and they did not believe it fell on deaf ears. And we see that in other places throughout the Bible. You know, I mean, Jesus tells parables about the word of grace, the good news that goes out, and some of it falls on this kind of ground, and some of it falls on this kind of ground, and some of it falls on this kind of ground. So he's not saying that everyone who hears will automatically be awakened. There are some, he says, who heard and who were not awakened, who did not see, who did not believe as a result of hearing what God had done for them. And so it begs the question, what is it from a human standpoint? What is it from a human standpoint that blocks belief in God's gift of righteousness or gift of rightness? Because if you're like me, there are people in your life who you may have said a thousand times, this is what Jesus has come to do for sinners like you and me. And you have painstakingly explained the good news that God is a rescuing God, that God has come to set people free, that God has come to liberate the oppressed and open blind eyes. And they look at you like you're nuts. I mean, they they just, they don't believe it, they can't see it, they don't understand what you understand, and they just, they, they are perpetually plagued by unbelief. And so, not only was it true back then, but it's also true today, it's true in your life, it's true in my life, that there are people who hear and don't believe. So it begs the question, what is it from a human standpoint that blocks belief? What is it from a human standpoint that keeps people from believing? Um, I mean, what is it that blocks people from seeing God's gift of righteousness? And it's not, okay, let me tell you first what it's not. If you look at verse 21, it's not that God doesn't freely offer it. Look at what he says in verse 21. 
But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So, in a sense, from a human standpoint, you can't blame God for unbelief. Okay, now we know that God is sovereign. God is the one who is sovereignly in charge of opening blind eyes and softening hard hearts that if you believe today, it's not the result of some faith you mustered up on your own as we looked at a couple weeks ago in Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and even this gift of faith doesn't come from you. It's a, it's a gift from God. And so we know from a divine standpoint, from a God standpoint, from a behind the scenes standpoint, that if you and I believe it's a result of God causing us to believe, awakening us and raising us from death to life. But from a human standpoint, you can't blame God. You can't say, well, I mean, I, I just, God never offered. Because he says very, very plainly here in verse 21, and there are lots of other places in the Bible where here he says, all day long I have held out my hands. I have offered this gift of rightness, this gift of righteousness to a disobedient and contrary people. So we know that the reason is not because God doesn't freely offer it. If you go back to Romans 10 verse three, we get a clue into what it is that blocks belief. What is it that keeps us enslaved? What is it? What is that thing that blocks belief, keeps us enslaved, keeps us burdened by the pressure to secure our own rightness, to secure our own worth and value, to justify ourselves, to validate our existence by who we are and what we can become? What is it that gets in the way? What is it that blocks that? Well, remember, if you go back to Romans 10.3, he tells us basically trusting in your own work blinds you from believing in God's work for you. Trusting in yourself, banking on you rather than banking on Jesus. Banking on your work, banking on your activity, banking on your efforts rather than banking everything on Jesus, betting it all on Christ. That's the thing, that's the thing that keeps us from believing. Believing in yourself, in other words, prevents you from believing in God. Believing in yourself, trusting in yourself, prevents you from trusting in God. But, and this is the good news, and this is what he goes on to say here, God overpowers unbelief. If you know God today, if you have a relationship with God today, if God has a relationship with you today, it is because he has overpowered unbelief in you, that he has opened your eyes and you see he is the one who came to rescue you. His love is unilateral. It's one way. It's descending one way love. And that descending one way love is what made you alive. Paul says that also in Ephesians chapter 2, that you were dead, but God made you alive. God raised you from the dead. And so what we find here is that God overpowers unbelief. God is capable of overpowering unbelief. He opens blind eyes and he softens hard hearts. And Paul illustrates this by telling a very old but familiar story. He hearkens back to 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19 where King Ahab introduced Baal worship. Baal was a big, you know, he was like the super idol of the day, all right? Uh, and King Ahab introduced Baal worship to Israel. And my favorite part of that story from the time I was a kid is the part of the story where there's this contest between Elijah and the priests of Baal. And this is basically the way that it went. Okay, in order to prove who was really God, they set up a contest. All right, it was like a, you know, um, gosh, what would it be like? A contest, okay? Um, and they set up this contest, and basically this is the way that it went. Each group, okay, you've got Elijah over here, represents God. You've got the priests of Baal, the idol over here, they represent Baal. And both of them are competing to show which God is the real God? Is God the real God or is Baal the idol the real God? And so each group takes a bull, if you remember the story, each group takes a bull and lays it on an altar of wood. 
And they're each gonna call out to their God, either Baal or God, and whoever can summon the fire required to burn the sacrifice wins. Okay, so you've got the priests of Baal over here, You've got Elijah over here. They both have their separate altars. They both have a bull, a dead bull, and they put it on the altar. And basically, they call down fire from heaven. And whichever sacrifice is burned up, that must prove that that one is the real God. And so the priests of Baal go first. And I mean, they literally get everything right. All the variables are just right. Nice dry wood. I mean, everything. And they call out. You know, oh, Baal. I remember my mother telling me this story when I was a kid, and she told it so phenomenally well. Uh, but you know, oh, Baal, come. Them, they're begging Baal to send fire, and, and nothing, okay? Obviously, nothing. It's like a stone. So nothing, nothing happens. And they keep calling and calling and calling hour after hour, and nothing's happening. So Elijah, like the good, pious, holy man that he is, begins mocking them, all right? And he basically says stuff like, uh, shout a little bit louder. Maybe, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's sleeping. And then he goes on to say, just wait a second. Maybe he's in the bathroom. He'll be back in a second. Okay? So he's just mocking him, you know, mocking him, saying, I mean, come on. You, wh- where is this God of yours? Baal, where is he? Um, and then it's Elijah's turn. Nothing happens, okay? Fire never comes. Everything remains as is on the altar. And then it's Elijah's turn. And instead of gathering all the dry wood and making sure all the variables were just right, Elijah does something pretty remarkable. He, he orders a trench built around the altar, and he orders four large jars of water poured over everything. The altar, the wood, the bull, you name it. And then he orders four more jars of water poured over everything, and then four more big jars of water poured over everything. So much water was poured over this altar that the trench around the altar that he had built was filled with water and overflowing. Okay, it was drenched. I mean, soaked. Absolutely soaked. And he wants to make a point. He wants to say that, you know, it's not because of the wood and it's not because of the bull and it's not because the altar's just right. I am going to stack the odds against God and show you that God and God alone is the real God. And so, of course, Elijah calls on God and calls on fire from God to burn up everything, and immediately fire from heaven comes down, not only burns up the altar, not only burns up the bull, not only burns up all of the wet wood, but it says it was so hot, the fire was so hot that it actually caused the water that was all in the trench to evaporate, okay, it was gone. It even says that the dust around it was burnt up. Okay, so I mean, everything's just gone, burnt to a crisp. And as a result, the real God demonstrates that he is God. Well, some time passes. I mean, you see, this is, this is like the, in a sense, like the God showing himself. It's the preaching of the gospel. It's in front of the nation. And the, you know, the priests of Baal and Baal himself are soundly defeated. And these people still did not believe. They still didn't believe. You know? I mean, at that point, you would think they would go, okay, we get it. All right, all right. Baal is nothing more than a stone. God is the real God. But what you find when you go on, um, when you go on in chapter 19, what you discover is that Elijah still feels alone. It's like he's the only one left that believes in God. After God's unbelievable demonstration of power, after God's unbelievable demonstration that he is the real God, Elijah feels totally alone. Like, I am the only one left who believes. And he says that in our verses here, um, where Paul quotes him in saying in verse 3, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life, or back, if you go back to Kings 19, verse 14, the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and now they're trying to kill me. They're trying to kill me. So Elijah feels alone. He feels like he's done everything he can do. These people are still hard-hearted and blind. They don't see, I mean, think about his job description. 
He's a prophet. What's his job? His job is to speak on behalf of God to the people of God. And he has categorically failed as a preacher. Okay, I remember when God commissioned Isaiah and he says, hey, listen, um, I want you to be my spokesperson. I want you to be the one who tells my people who I am and what I've done and what I plan to do. And Isaiah is a little bit resistant at first, of course, but he finally says, okay. And um, God says, oh, by the way, no one's ever going to listen to a word you say. I mean, that, no one's ever going to listen to you. Your, your conversion rate in terms of people who believe is going to be zero, all right? I mean, for whatever reason, and he never really explains to Isaiah, for whatever reason, God chose to speak his truth through the prophet Isaiah, and no one would believe, all right? So here, Elijah's kind of in the same boat. All right, I mean, he has done everything he could do. His job description is preacher to Israel. That's your job description, preacher to Israel. And no one believes, and he feels like a failure. I mean, he feels absolutely alone. Like, no one's listened to me. No one believes in you as a result of anything that I've said. I feel like a complete failure. And notice what God says. In response to Elijah, he says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And Paul says in verse 5 of these verses, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. And then he reiterates in verse 6 here what he said in chapter 10, verse 3, when he says, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. In other words, what was blocking these people from believing? You go back to 10.3, Romans 10 verse 3, Paul tells us there as well, what's blocking these people from believing is their trust in their own works. Their trust in themselves, their banking on themselves. That's what's keeping them from believing, which is the antithesis of what Paul says here, being chosen by grace. And so he says very plainly um, in verse 6, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but let me just say this. Lots of people inside the church or people who grew up in church read this verse and say, well, he's just talking about our initial conversion, you know, that moment when God saved us. And most of us who grew up at least in Protestant circles would say, of course we believe that, you know? I mean, we know that you can't do enough good things to outweigh the bad things, that, you know, it's not our good works that gain God's affection and gain God's approval. It's not our good works that justify us. We understand that. We believe that. Um, but he's talking about only our initial conversion. Because there's lots of works that we do after, what does Paul say in Ephesians? For God saved us and prepared for us beforehand good works for us to do. So people read this verse here and go, well, I mean, he's only talking about conversion. He's only talking about the fact that our works do not contribute to our justification, okay, in theological terms. But do our works contribute to our sanctification? Now, um, in theological terms, we can say it this way, uh, if you're interested in theological terms, which you should be, I hope you are. Um, I know we can't justify ourselves by our works, but we can sanctify ourselves by our works. Okay, that's the way we typically think about it. Um, but remember what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3? He's rebuking the Galatian Christians. And this is what he says, as plain as day. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, it's one thing to say that we're not justified by works, um, but we, we can't justify ourselves by our works. We can't sanctify ourselves by our works. That's one thing, and that's bad, 
okay? That's not to say that God's work in us does not produce love for God and neighbor. I mean, we know that. The way good works are defined in the Bible is not some ethereal thing. It's love for God and neighbor. That's what Jesus said the fulfillment of the law is. When he said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And when the Pharisees tried to trick him and say, well, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus summarizes the entirety of the Ten Commandments by saying, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the fulfillment of the law, the totality of the law, love for God and love for neighbor. So when we, when we talk about good works, we tend to think about good works pietistically as if our good works are for God. It's not. Our love for God is demonstrated in the way that we serve our neighbor. Okay, that's what James makes very, very clear. The whole book of James is all about the difference between dead faith and living faith. And one way to see what living faith looks like is when we serve our neighbor. It's not as if, and this is what Luther said, our, you know, God doesn't need our good works, our neighbor does. I mean, that's not, good works are not for God. Good works are not a vertical transaction with God. Good works are a horizontal demonstration of our love for neighbor because God in Christ has loved us. Okay, so when we talk about good works, that's what we're talking about. And to say that our good, that we can sanctify ourselves by good works is a, is a huge, huge source of confusion. So there's one, uh, I'll read you a couple quotes. One uh, Dutch theologian that I've quoted before who is now dead, named Herman Bovink, um, he put it this way. Sanctification, as well as justification, is a gift purely of grace. Okay, in other words, it's a, it's a gift. You can't say that one is a gift and one is a work, One, they're both gifts. They are gifts purely of grace, which is why later in Galatians, Paul compares the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. Huge difference. Okay, he, he describes the works of the flesh. These are things we do to try and save ourselves. Anger, immorality, blah, blah, blah. He goes on and on and on, and he begins to sort of describe these various pathways, these various avenues by which we try and save ourselves. You know, these, these are works of the flesh. These are self-salvation projects, things that if we pursue, we believe will set us free. And then he compares that list with what he calls the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Works of the flesh, this is what we do, and it gets us into a heap of trouble. Fruit of the Spirit, which is something God does. It's something God gifts. This is the fruit. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are things that are not something we muster up on our own. Those aren't works in a sense that we create. Those are gifts. That's the fruit of the Spirit working in us. So when Paul says in Philippians um, that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and then he adds to that, for it is God who works in you. That's sanctification. It is God who works in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And so what Paul is saying is that birth and growth is a gift from God, and the thing that gets in the way of birth also gets in the way of growth, banking on our works rather than God's grace. For if it is by works, it can no longer be by grace. So Martin Lloyd-Jones, another quote, Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way, I love this quote. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was an amazing preacher from back in the 1900s, Uh, put it this way. He says it. We can put it this way. The man who has faith is the man who is no longer looking at himself and no longer looking to himself. He no longer looks at anything he once was. He does not look at what he is now. He does not even look at what he hopes to be as the result of his own efforts. He looks entirely to the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work and rests on that alone. He stops saying things like, ah yes, I used to commit terrible sins, but now I have done this and that. 
if he goes on saying those kinds of things, he has not got faith. Faith speaks in an entirely different manner and makes a man say, yes, I have sinned grievously. I have lived a life of sin, yet I know that I am a child of God because I am not resting on any righteousness of my own. My righteousness is in Jesus Christ and God has put that to my account. So what he's describing there and what Paul's describing here is that whether you're talking about birth or growth, in theological terms, whether you're talking about regeneration or sanctification, justification or sanctification, whatever the case may be, both are gifts of grace. And if we begin to go backwards and bank on our own works, grace ceases to be grace, Paul makes clear. So if that's the case, then who are the kinds of people God gives faith to? I just said a few minutes ago that, um, you know, I mean, unbelief is what blocks our seeing God and knowing God and seeing what God has given to sinners like me in the person and work of Jesus. It's unbelief. It's unbelief that keeps us burdened. It's unbelief that keeps us enslaved because when we don't believe in God's work, we have to bank on our own work. And it's our own work that burdens us and puts pressure on us. And now we have to set ourselves free. We have to rescue ourselves. We, we have to save ourselves. So who are the kinds of people that God gives faith to? And this is the part of this passage that I absolutely love because at first glance, it might look like God gives faith to the good people. You know, we read the Elijah story, and it sounds like there were 7,000 good people left. Elijah's not the only one after all. You know, don't, God says, there's 7,000, you're not the only good person here, good boy. There's 7,000 other good boys here, okay? Um, So it sounds like, sounds like God gives faith to the good people. And then we read what Paul says about the people in his day, and it seems like Paul is saying, there are some good people left. You know, there's a remnant. I mean, there's, there's still a remnant. There are some good people left. You know, there are good people left in this world. And it's the good people that get God's attention. Remember when we looked at the, the Noah story uh, last fall or the fall before that or the fall before that? I don't remember. They all start running together in my mind. Um, but remember, it's very easy to go back and read the Noah story where it says, and Noah found favor in the eyes of God. And the way I always understood that story when I was a kid was that the world was a really bad place filled with lots and lots of bad people. And God was desperately scanning the landscape, hoping to find one, just one good guy. And all of a sudden, he wakes up one morning and he sees Noah. He's like, oh, thank myself. There's one left, you know? And then because of Noah's morality and because of Noah's goodness, God says, you are favorable to me because you're not like them. That's the way we typically read it. But I mentioned back then that if you go back and read it in context, you got to read a couple verses before that, um, where basically the Bible says everyone was evil. Didn't say everyone was evil but Noah. Everyone was evil. Everyone was bad. And then it says God came to Noah. It was God's love of Noah that made Noah righteous. It was not Noah's righteousness that made God love him. And that's consistent with the rest of the Bible. I mean, throughout the rest of the Bible, God is always taking the initiative. We are, Paul says, we looked at Romans chapter 3, we are, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. No one seeks after God. No one, no one seeks after God. In fact, he speaks about, um, about the Gentiles in verse uh, 20 when he's quoting Isaiah. I've been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. I mean, if you, if you know God today, it's not because you asked for him. It's because he came to you. If your eyes have been opened, it's not because you're smarter than the person sitting next to you whose eyes are closed. It's that God opened your eyes. God set you free. God showed you who he was, and God showed you salvation, and God raised you from death to life. And so um, we, we read these things, you know, whether it's the Elijah story, 
or the Noah story, or even what Paul says here. And if you don't read it carefully, it may insinuate that God gives faith to good people. You know, God, God is scanning the landscape for a few good men, and those are the people that he will use to usher in his glorious kingdom. He's looking for good people. He's desperately trying to find good people. You know, dare to be a Daniel. Now just be a Daniel. God uses Daniels. You know, strong men who stand up to the man. That's who God uses. But is that really the kinds of people God uses? Paul says later that, um, you know, it's the foolish things of the world that God uses to shame the wise. It's, it's the weak that God uses to shame the strong. It's in our weakness that God's strength is perfected. In other words, God is in the business of choosing low lowlifes like me so that no one in the world can ever say, wow, I know why he's so smart because he's so smart. And that's why God loves him, okay? That's not the way God works. God chooses losers because losers are all that he has to choose from, all right? I mean, seriously, that really, I mean, I've said this before, that God chooses bad people because bad people are all that there are. It's not like there's a group of bad people and there's this remnant over here that's good, and God likes them because they're good. Um, what does he say about this remnant? He's encouraging his readers here, and he says, just like it was back in the day where God says, I have reserved for myself, I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So here he says, just as it is today, there is a remnant chosen by grace. There is a remnant, there is a group that is chosen by grace. Um, and, he, and he says, um, Paul uses this story of Elijah and the priests of Baal and the 7,000 men to show that God acts in a different way than we expect him to. We just... If, if you have a moralistic understanding of Christianity, you will have a moralistic view of the God of Christianity. And yet what we discover is that God acts in the exact opposite way that we would expect him to. You know, God, God does not choose, God does not choose us the way that we, you know, choose the kid in fourth grade with the Christian care and give him the Christian character award. I mean, God just doesn't do that. I mean, God is always choosing the underdog, the loser, the bad person, the rebel, all, the, all of those things. Um, so Paul suggests that God chose the 7,000 men back in Elijah's day in advance of their faithfulness in much the same way that he decided to give Jericho to Joshua in advance of the fight. Remember we looked at that too? He says, I, victory is yours. Now go collect the bounty. Okay, it's not like he said, if you go do this, go do this. You, you walk by faith and not by sight. You go do this big thing where you march around the wall and you shout and you scream and you dance and you blow trumpets and all that stuff. You go do this crazy thing. And if you do it, victory will be yours. So this is a test. He doesn't say that. He comes to Joshua before the battle and says, I have given them into your hands. Now just go. Well, in the same way that he chose Jacob over Esau before the Bible says they had done anything good or bad. We saw that in Romans 9. And in the same way that he chose us to be his own before the foundation of the world. We saw that in Romans 9. I mean, this is the way God chooses. These are the kinds of people that God selects. So it's natural for us to think that God chooses good people, but we've already seen that God rescues bad people because bad people are all that there are. God's choice, in other words, is based on grace, not works. So it's not our faithfulness that prompts God's election. It's God's election that prompts our faithfulness. 
There is a big difference between those two things, and if you don't get those two things right, you will, you will understand the Christian life wrongly. You will think about the Christian life in terms of perform, being on a performance treadmill. So much good for me generates so much favor from God, so much bad for me generates so much disfavor from God, um, that God's love for me and acceptance of me is ultimately anchored in how I perform rather than how Jesus has performed for me, that God's love to me is dependent on my love for him, but the fact of the matter is God's love for us, you know this, First John tells us this in chapter four, God's love for us does not depend on our love for him, our love for him depends on his love for us. That might just seem like a cute turn of phrase, but that defines the way you think about God, the way you think about the Christian life, because our natural default mode, because we're conditional people, and God's love is an unconditional power and person, our natural default mode is to simply think, uh, you know, I mean, God's love for me is dependent on my love for Him. So on those days when I am really loving God well by serving my neighbor and being selfless and being kind and gentle and all of those things, God, God loves me more on those days. And on those days when I wake up kind of grumpy and I look over at my spouse and I'm like, "Mm, you again, you know, and I go downstairs and you see your kids and you're like, oh my gosh, you've ruined my life. And, you know, you go to work and you're like, I, you know, I don't like any of these people. You're driving to work. I don't like any of these people. Um, You know, I mean, it's just, it's so, you don't wake up and have your quiet time, you know, and you don't do all the things that you were told to do in youth group growing up. I mean, you when you're not doing, on the day when you're not doing those things, it's, it, it, is it not true that you think, well, God's just ticked? He's ticked at me. You know, he doesn't want to have anything to do with me today. He doesn't, he doesn't want to have anything to do with me today. I've told you that story about uh, Jerry Bridges, who's written a number of fantastic books, and in his book, I think it's Transforming Grace, he tells the story that he tells whenever he goes on the road where he asks this question, you know, let's take two different kinds of days, a good spiritual day and a bad spiritual day. Good spiritual day, you wake up. Your alarm clock goes off at 5.30 in the morning because that's when all godly people wake up. And you you get up out of bed with a smile on your face and in your heart you're praising Jesus and you grab your Bible and you grab a cup of coffee and you go out and you have a remarkable quiet time and your quiet time, I love that, quiet time. I love quiet time. Whether it has anything to do with God or not, I love quiet time. So I'm, but you know, you have your, you, you go, you read your Bible, you pray. Uh, you know, your, your wife or your husband finally wakes up and you're kind and uh, you're nice and your kids finally get up and they're getting ready for school and you're nice and you're kind and you get in your car to go to work and, you know, I mean, you're, you're playing Amy Grant all the way there, you know? Um, and you get to work and you're just, you know, you're kind to everybody, you're loving everybody, you're just, you know, in your heart, you're, ap- you're just really thanking God for the life that he's given you. That's a good spiritual day. At the end of that day, God gives you an opportunity to share the gospel with an unbelieving coworker, friend of yours, okay? Bad spiritual day. You wake up, you're grumpy. I mean, really, really grumpy. You're not thanking God for your spouse. You're not thanking God for your kids. You don't even want to read your Bible because God kind of ticks you off yourself, you know? Uh, You don't pray except to say, why have you given me this woman or this man, you know, like Adam did in the garden. It's you who gave me her. Um, It's your fault. You know, you're sort of grumpy and you're moaning and you're groaning. You're thinking about work and all the people you hate there. Um, And, you know, you get in your car. You're not listening to Amy Grant. You're listening to Highway to Hell by ACDC, blaring it all the way there, all right? Which is very therapeutic, by the way, sometimes. Um... And you finally get to work and you're just moaning and you're groaning and you're looking around at everybody and you're like, I hate you all. All, Have you you guys not had these days? I mean, seriously, you're lying if you say you haven't, all right? You're lying. God knows you're lying if you say you haven't. Um, You know, you're just sort of annoyed with life. You don't like yourself. You don't like other people. Uh, You're a victim of all sorts of injustice. And at the end of that day, God gives you an opportunity to share the gospel with an unbelieving coworker friend of yours. And Jerry Bridges puts it this way. On what day do you think God will bless your evangelistic efforts? And of course he says, wherever he goes, most people say, well, on the good day. And he goes on to say, well, that just proves you believe in karma, not Christianity. 
See, there's this default mode that we are sort of naturally gravitate toward, and it's this idea that God's love for us depends on our love for Him. You see how believing in that will completely change the way you think about God and the Christian life and all of those things? What if instead of believing that, you believe that your love for God is dependent on God's love for you, that we love Him because He first loved us? And like the end of Romans 8 says, and therefore, because this whole thing is riding on Jesus and God's love for you and what He accomplished for you in the person and work of Jesus, there is nothing. Your good days don't make God love you more, and your bad days don't make God love you less, because there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. There, there's nothing. Okay, so in fact, I don't know about you, but typically it's on my bad days that I sense God's nearness even more. Because good days can be dangerous, can't they? I mean, what happens on good days is you start believing your own press. I really am better than that guy over there. (laughs) I mean, I really am doing a better job than that person. Of course God likes me. Look at me. I mean, I'm faithful, and I'm diligent, and I'm a hard worker, and these people over there are none of those things. I don't, I mean, I just don't, I don't say things that I shouldn't say, and I I exercise self-control, and I'm gentle, and I'm kind, and I mean, those days oftentimes are more dangerous than your bad days. Because the better you think you're becoming, the less marvelous Jesus becomes to you. Because you don't need him as bad. <laughs> you just don't need him as much. I've said this before, but it's like somehow, some way, we come to believe that we needed Jesus a lot at the beginning. I mean, he had to raise us from the dead after all. But Christian growth is this is this uh, sort of process whereby because we're getting better and better and better, we need Jesus less and less and less. So we needed him a lot at the beginning, but we don't need him as much as we grow. That Christian growth really is this sort of ability to begin standing on our own two feet, which is why good days can become more dangerous than bad days. Because grace always flows downhill. It always meets us at the bottom. Always meets us at the bottom. It always meets us in desperation. It always meets us in the low places, the bad places. I mean, it's when I have been being bad and someone has in return, in in return of my being bad, been good to me, what happens in those moments? I mean, are you not just sort of overcome and overwhelmed by conviction that you've done something mean and they've done something nice in return, that they've done something, you've done something bad and they've done something good to you, that they've paid your bad, they've paid back your bad with something good. Does that, not only does it bring about conviction, but it just melts the hard heart. And it just, it's, it's love that begets love. It's the kindness of the Lord, Paul says, that leads to repentance. These are the kinds of things. And so we, we have to understand that when Paul here and the rest of the Bible elsewhere make it clear that it's not, it is not our faithfulness that prompts God's election, it's God's election that prompts our faithfulness, and that it's God's love for us um, that produces love for others. It's not our love for others or love for God that makes God love us more. Big difference between those two things. So when Paul says grace would no longer be grace, he means to counter this default mode, this idea that says grace will get me 99 yards and works will get me one. But you see, if grace is in response to even one work, it ceases to be grace completely because the one yard you have to go determines everything else. I mean, if you're a football fan, you know 99 yards is not enough. Not enough. 
I mean, it's, this is what, back in the Reformation times, uh, this is what Erasmus and Martin Luther argued about during the Reformation, and it's an argument that continues today, whether people even know who Erasmus is. I thank God my mother had a choice when she named me, all right? She had her choice of church history heroes. She was studying an early church father by the name of Tertullian when she was pregnant with me. She didn't know if I was going to be a boy or a girl. This is before those times where you could figure that stuff out beforehand. And she prayed, and she said, I, God, if this child growing in my womb happens to be a boy, I want to be just like Tertullian. So July 13th, 1972, mark it down. That means a month and a half from now is my birthday. Um, I popped out, boom, you know, ready to roll, ready to roll. Smile on my face like, what's next, you know? My mom says, that was the look on my face when I came out. Well, like, you know, most kids come out crying. They've just gone through a very traumatic experience making their way down the birth canal. You know, their heads are kind of cone-shaped, and they're all, you know, I, I, my mom says, I came out like this. What's next, you know? Um, so, <laughs> I came out July 13, 1972, and my mom named me William Graham Tertullian Chivijan. You know, and thankfully, you know, after the drugs wore off two days later, she dropped the tur. Thank God. All right. And then instead of making my life easier, since she knew I had inherited this laborious, horrible last name, so she could have just called me by my first name, Bill, you know, or Will, they decided to refer to me from the time I was born by my middle name, Tullian. Um, well, she had choices. I'm actually glad she chose Tullian because it could have been Erasmus, you know? You imagine Pastor Erasmus. Um, <laughs> it would have been even worse. Anyway, all right, all that to say, um, this is the very thing that Erasmus and Luther were arguing about during the Reformation, and it's an argument that continues today because this is what Erasmus was saying. A little church history lesson. Erasmus was saying something that you've heard a million times. You just need to do this one easy thing. Accept God. Make that one good choice, and God will do the rest. You know, just, just make that choice. You, you just make the choice, and God will do the rest. And Luther was just hopping mad when he heard this because he basically said, if you're going to make salvation dependent on works, at least make it hard. That's cheap salvation. All you got to do is this one thing. You know, you, you have to do something, but it's just this one cheap, easy thing. And Luther's point was, no, salvation is not easy. It's not even hard. It's impossible. Which is why Jesus didn't simply give us great field position. He went the length of the field for us. He took it to the house. Okay, he didn't wasn't like he returned the punt to the two-yard line and said, I've given you great field position. Surely you can punch it in from here. Okay? I mean, he didn't, Jesus didn't come to give you and I a great field position. He took it the length of the field, and that's what this means, that the gospel is not a story of God meeting sinners halfway. The gospel is not God will love us a lot if we love him a little. The gospel is while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, while we were at our worst, God gave us his best. That we weren't seeking him, crying out for him. We oftentimes seek the gifts that only God can give, but we're not seeking God. That's a different thing. We just, we just want the benefits that only God can give, whatever that is, worth, value, justification, rightness, all those things, significance, security. We want those things that only God can give, but we try to get those things ourselves. And, um, and the gospel is, no, while, while you were at your worst, God gave you your best. God gave you his best. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We, we are a remnant chosen by grace, chosen by grace rescued by grace, elected by grace, selected by grace, made alive by grace, not, not by works. I've said it before that the only thing we contribute to this transaction is the sin that makes this transaction necessary. So it's not that we come to the table, this table. We don't come to the Lord's Supper with clean hands and something to offer 
We come to the table weak and needy and desperate and dirty, and what this table does is it communicates God's one-way love for us in the person of Jesus. It's one of the beautiful things about the sacraments, either baptism or the Lord's Supper, is that it demonstrates in a tangible, tangible way that God takes the initiative, that God comes to us because we would never go to Him that God has come down because we could never climb up, that God meets us at the bottom. As I said a couple weeks ago, that God is a, he's a bottom feeder. He's a bottom dweller. He meets us at the bottom in our filth, in our unbelief, in our badness, in our weakness. He meets us there. And the Lord's Supper is one additional way that God says, I've come to you. Taste and see that I am good. I have come to do for you what you could never do for yourself. That's why the gospel's called good news. It's not good news if it's dependent on you. It's not good news if it's dependent on me. What makes it good news is that it's not dependent on me. What makes it good news is that it is wholly dependent on another. And that's what we celebrate. 